Hi folks, and thanks for attending the webinar on Highland RPA 101 that we're doing in conjunction with Naviant. Uh, my name is Tim Talixson. I'm the Director of Intelligent Process Automation Solutions here at Highland. Um, been part, uh, proud to be part of this company for about 18 years now. And fun fact I'll throw out there for you is that I personally have been working with Naviant for about 25 years in one way or another, all the way back to the days when they were called uh, MTM. So if anybody out there has uh, been working with them as long or longer, I'd love to hear from you. A fabulous organization to be aligned with. Uh, today, our basic agenda is uh, going to cover a few things. Um, we're going to talk about RPA, what it is and where you can use it. We're going to jump right into a quick demo of Highland RPA and show you how it works in conjunction with OnBase Workflow. We'll talk about some specific use cases along the way. I'll give you a little bit of information about the product itself, not too technical, but just a little bit so you'll understand some of the moving pieces. A little bit about tr some trends in RPA robotic process automation, and then I think a really uh, important part is how do you get started? What next steps are out there for you to uh, continue on your, your journey? All right, so this is a bit of a wordy slide, but I think it's important because I think the words matter. So I've included the link at the bottom if you want to do some additional research about RPA and where it, you know, where it came from, where it's going. But this really spoke to me, this quote here. Uh, and, and it kind of tells the story of how did we get where we are and why is the RPA even necessary? And so if you think about the, th the last 30 years, we've witnessed a multitude of new core IT systems being implemented in businesses. I'm sure you've had that in your organization. I sure know we've had it in ours too. So these include on-premise systems, cloud-based systems, uh, applications, desktop applications, maybe some on-base, maybe some brainware, things like that. They're all being used daily, simultaneously. The resulting landscape strewn with dis disparate systems has a left a long tail of micro level data processing gaps between all of them, right? So yeah, some systems integrate, yeah, so systems integrate, but not always completely holistically. There's always some manual work left between the systems that you know we ask employees to do. So these system to system gaps are not being filled by other systems currently. They're being filled with people. So in other words, there's a lot of copying and pasting going on today to connect system A to system B, not to mention systems C, D, E and so on. And this is a ripe opportunity for the convenience and the processing power of robots. And uh, I, I think I think you probably have an inkling, some knowledge of that already, and hopefully you see that a little bit more as we go through this bit of a presentation. So if I were to ask all of you, anybody really, share with me a diagram of what your IT systems look like, what your infrastructure looks like. You may share with me something that looks somewhat like this, a, a rather technical looking diagram. You may share something that is a little bit more systems focused or business application focused and say this is how they're all tied together. But you know rather humorously I think uh, if we're all being honest, most systems look a lot more like this game, and I love this game as a kid. Um, I extended this game myself and brought in new systems. I bring in, you know, Hot Wheels and Legos and, and all kinds of other things, additional army men to kind of extend the system a little bit, make it even more complicated. And as technologists today, we all deal with this a little bit. We're trying to tie together systems that generally weren't really intended to work together. You know, we all have a bathtub and a bucket and a lamp post and some rickety stairs, and we've got to make them all work so at the end of the day, we can catch the mouse. And, uh, you know, in the game, we depend upon the silver ball rolling between all of these systems to bring it all together as an enterprise solution. Uh, but, you know, today, like that example we talked about, is we depend upon people largely to do a lot of that work. And uh, in the future, we can look at robotic process automation to do a lot of that lifting for us. So just another definition slide for you. I'm not going to read this one. <clears throat> one of the things I always talk about with RPA is that if you, if you think about it real simple, all it really does is emulate keystrokes and mouse clicks. It does the same work with applications that people do. So it works through that same user interface that you already have exposed out to your user base today. Yes, it can call some web services and APIs if you need to do those things pro programmatically, but largely, you know, the problems we're looking to solve are those automation problems where people are, you know, working from screen A to screen B and going out to an external website and bringing data back and, and those sort of things. So it really just follows the rules. It doesn't think. It doesn't do any of that stuff. Uh, you know, we can talk largely about intelligent automation, but, you know, RPA, very rules-based 
and very configurable to just just you know replicate those keystrokes and users and what they're doing today and some of the common applications that um, you would look to automate or some of the common sort of tasks are opening emails and like I said logging into other web applications moving files and copying and pasting data we have so many current customers that we're working with now that they have to reach out to external websites peruse around and look for documents and data and bring that back into their own base system and a largely a lot of those tasks were pushed upon them because other companies automated or another level of compliance came about. Um, so it has made the job internally even more difficult and really it has pushed the bounds of what the original systems were even designed for. So uh, anytime you've got these sort of tasks, performing calculations, working with spreadsheets, um, filling in forms, these are good things that you can have a bot do. They're very task focused, rules based. And uh, many of the benefits are those, uh, you know, things you would think, right? So I, I talked about that native system integration. RPA interacts with the user interfaces. Therefore, it can work with anything you already have, no matter the version. It could be web-based or green screen-based. That's fine. It's designed to work with all of those things. It's very scalable, gives you complete security and audit trails around the whole process. And whereas some folks may think like, man, this is really going to eliminate jobs within the organization, what we're finding is that it's freeing up time for people to focus on higher level tasks, thinking, using their brain, making better decisions rather than being sort of just, you know, um, buried with all this routine data, data entry type work. So it's freeing up the humans to do the human work and letting the bots do the bot work. Uh, and some use cases that probably shouldn't be too surprising to you. Uh, these are business um, processes across a lot of different industries, the same places you might use OnBase, the same places you might see documents flowing through a process, the stuff that we kind of all deal with and think about all the time. Those are great applications for RPA, as well as some of the you know back office type operations around finance and accounting and HR, seeing a lot, a lot of traction in those areas with our customers too. Uh, so great places to think about how you can apply RPA. Uh, what I'm going to do now is show you a bit of a demo uh, of RPA, and I recorded a demo, and I'm going to do a bit of voice, uh, a bit of a voiceover for it. Removes the element of something kind of maybe going sideways in my in my demo here. It's about five minutes long, um, and I'm planning on delivering this PowerPoint deck out to everybody that uh, reviews this. So I've embedded this video right into the PowerPoint uh, so that you could use it and maybe share and show some of your coworkers. So let me click to the next slide. And uh, I'm going to click play on this and just kind of let it rip for about five minutes. See a little bit of a workflow process laid out in front of you. And just from a little order of operations, you know, he's going to log into the software, go to the home screen, find the workflow interface. And that's kind of how you configure a bit of an RPA process. Very simple. So what you see happening here is he executed the process. It went ahead and launched on base, navigated to a workflow queue, pulled up an item. You can see the keywords on the right hand side from that item. It launched a, uh, in this case, a Chrome screen and navigated to an Ohio license lookup. So, you know, um, see if I can pause here for a second. The business uh, function here is uh, somebody needs to check the license for a particular, in this case, a physician, a, a doctor. Um, could be any uh, sort of work situation like that. A, um, an item gets routed to a workflow queue, and it's a job of a human to uh, monitor that workflow queue and work on those items. And maybe what they need to do is go to an external system to look up some information to verify or validate what they're looking at or make some sort of a decision or do some sort of calculation uh, or even do some data entry into another system. It's a very common endpoint that we create in on-base workflows. We send stuff to a queue and give people a bunch of ad hoc tasks. Well, in this new way of looking at work, maybe what we do is we send work to a queue and we have a robot monitor that queue and do that work. So in this case, the keyword information about that item that got sent to the queue is enough for us to figure out, oh, we need to check the license for this physician for the state of Ohio 
and see if it's expired yet or if they're in good standing. And while we're at it, let's go ahead and grab a copy of that and put that as a document inside of the OnBase process so that we have it for later lookup. Um, and maybe this just gets done on a scheduled basis without any human interacting at all. Uh, we know what we are, you know, uh, the, the document we have on record is 30 days from being uh, potentially expired. So let's go ahead and kick off a timer and uh, go through this whole process to make sure that we validate and verify that uh, they're in good standing. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of click play on the process here and you'll see what's happening is the robot is actually talking to this web page and it's going to take keyword information that it lifted from the document um, quote unquote type it into the screen and look up the particular license and in this case scroll down on the document create a viewable version of that a printable version of it right go back to on base and update some keywords you can see on the right hand side the status has been um, checked and updated, the effective date, the expiration date, all that stuff's uh, been, been um, updated inside of OnBase. And we're going to go through the process of actually taking a copy of that license, dumping it to a PDF. All right, you see that happening here. And then that PDF is going to be imported into OnBase and stored as an associated document with that work item. Um, and then I believe that's probably the end of the process. We'll show you here the document, uh, we'll pick the doc type, it's a license certificate screenshot, we'll enter in some keywords about it, probably the license number here, uh, so it gets stored appropriately inside of OnBase and away we go. Now, um, this kind of got slowed down this whole process here so that we could observe it, but this would happen in the background on a server running thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of times by an unattended bot. Um, now, occasionally there might be hiccups in the process and those, the bot would be configured to handle those or let's route those to another downstream queue for a human to handle that small percentage of things that didn't flow through the standard process. Um, and, and as you can see, a very simple example, but it's a great example of on base having to reach out to the outside world and interact with other systems and you could imagine the potential complexity of that if we're saying well we have um, clinicians from all 50 states and have all kinds of different licenses that need to be validated with all kinds of different license bureaus some of those systems have apis or web services some of them are very cryptic um, you know so we're going to use rpa to navigate all those web pages or all those sites to verify that information and pull it back in. In the, in the past, we would have surfaced that up for a human to work on, but going forward, uh, we can have a bot do that. And this is just a classic example of, uh, a simple example of how we can use RPS. Hopefully all right, a uh, quick example, but hopefully a pretty thorough example of, of how you can see RPA being tied into on-base workflow. Uh, it's not the, not by any means the only example, lots of ways that you could use RPA inside of your Highland products or anywhere in your environment to automate uh, those kind of manual steps between systems. What we saw there was a little bit of insight and what you're seeing on the screen here is a little bit about uh, the Highland RPA product itself. We saw just a little tad of designer where you would configure, that's under the build part, designer is where you, you would configure the processes and then conductor under run, that's what really ran that process. Um, prior to all of that, we would use a tool called the RPA analyst to record the the keystrokes and mouse clicks by a user to build some documentation and build the base level configuration. That's also part of the package. Really helps you get moving quickly to uh, implementing a bot in production. And then there's the manager piece all the way on the right there, which allows, gives you a console to manage all the bots and processes that you have in a production environment and really keep track of that. So full suite of products under this umbrella of Highland RPA. And uh, just a little bit more detail about what each one of those those four pieces of the suite would do for you. Um, <clears throat> worth noting also that the bots can kind of work together too. If you've got a very large or complicated process, uh, much like today you might have a team lead and a bunch of uh, workers in a department, um, or you might have even a load balanced on-base workflow queue that distributes work out to people based upon you know, their capacity, their skill set, their availability, things like that. Um, that same sort of concept would work its way over into the digital world. We can have a bot 
hand out work or chunks of work to processing level bots in order to do work based upon their availability, based upon your current workload and things like that. So you could have this complicated process where you've got multiple business processes handled by a number of bots and having this one data collector bot really making decisions for you on how to run them the most efficiently. And one of the reasons that we can do that, and this differentiates our product from a few other products on the market, is that we can take all of those processes and really break them down into what we call artifacts and microbots, and those microbots would make up uh, processes themselves. So those reusable parts get stored in the repository, the back-end database, and they can be assigned to different production level bots uh, when necessary. And that really helps us uh, continue moving this in a very efficient process. And, and this is a real complicated kind of visual here, but you know, if we had six processes all the way on the left-hand side of my diagram here, all running on their own bot, uh, we would have a lot of wasted time uh, when, you know, those bots are not handling any work. In the middle example, we could probably make some good scheduling decisions and optimize that a little by combining things, but because of the way the software works and breaks things down into smaller chunks, it takes advantage of those small wait states and those gaps inside of the process and can hand them off to a smaller number of bots in order to do the work. So really, you know, think of this like instead of having six all, you know, um, average workers in a department, you've got like two super workers in your department that can run all day, handle all kinds of work and get the processes done uh, when they need to get done in the most efficient way possible. So another advantage of bringing RPA into the process there too. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some trends in RPA and uh, not that I'm giving you a reading assignment, but I highly encourage you to pick up this book from Pascal Bournet. It was published in December of 2020 um, and it is fantastic. If, if you are a technologist, like I think you are, you may not consider yourself one, but if you're watching an RPA webinar, you are a technologist uh, and you apply technology in your everyday life to solve business problems, this book is cutting edge. It is right there. And it really talks about uh, this topic and broadly all about intelligent automation because this topic of RPA is just a piece of what fits into what Pascal Bournet uh, laid out as his vision of intelligent automation. Complicated diagram here. Down on the bottom right, he talks about the execution portion of intelligent automation and RPA and workflow falls into that. But we also have other segments referred to as vision, uh, a common thing you would see under there is OCR, right? Our brainware product to help you lift information off of documents visually. Uh, thinking and learning, which would be um, also parts of something like brainware, but that's where machine learning and artificial intelligence come into place and how they fit in with some of the other capabilities of, an, of uh, intelligent automation. And then down here, uh, really a forward thinking, kind of further out there piece of this is, what's, is language support, natural language processing, uh, and speech analytics and things like that. So you can think about, you know, those bots in your house that you talk to and ask questions. Uh, I don't want to say the name of mine because he's right behind me and he'll go off, or she will, I should say. Um, but these, these pieces, this is really the trend that both the analysts and the vendors and cutting-edge companies are thinking and talking about is the overall technology umbrella of intelligent automation. And throw one more quote at you. I do like to do this because I really think the words are important. And I lifted this right out of the book there. Um, intelligent automation is not meant to replace the foundational systems used by companies, your ERPs, your mainframes, your websites, and things like that. But rather, it sits on top of that existing IT landscape. And the focus of uh, intelligent automation applications, applications is to automate the activities that are currently performed by the human workers including how they interact with and operate these systems, right? So really, you know, very supporting sort of statement of what we've been talking about throughout this presentation, which is you've got your existing infrastructure, you've got those gaps in the processes. Today, we put a lot of people in there. In the future, we put a lot of bots in there to do that. Uh, Pascal also does a really good job of talking about these trends, and I'm just going to build a slide out so you can sort of look at this problem statement, solution statement under each one of these four high-level bullets. Um, not 
trying to uh, you know steal any of his thunder or any of his hard work. This is definitely right from the book, but I couldn't agree with it more. This is absolutely what we are seeing with our customers and our prospects too. These are areas that were already a challenge pre-COVID that became exacerbated and really disruptive um, as we moved into a new way of working. Um, you know, this discontinued operations and dissatisfied customers and demotivated employees and the effect it all has on cash flow. Um, these are areas that as we emerge from COVID, uh, people are going to look to intelligent automation and robotic process automation as tools to help them solve these problems and lessen the impact of these going forward on their organizations. So I would say to yourself, take a look within your own organization, at these areas and many others, and look and think about how these technologies can help you with some of the struggles or maybe patchworks that you put in place to get you through the last year or so. Um, next steps for getting started. Um, I tend to say this phrase a lot to, to people within my own organization and customers. Is you can start automating today. There's not a lot of barriers to getting into this uh, technology area uh, for you. For one thing, you can, uh, if you've got a premium subscription, you can um, take a lot of courses that we've already published for you uh, on training.highland.com. And this is everything from some 20 minute e learning courses right up to some three day instructor led developer certification courses and a bunch of things in between. There's about eight or nine of them up there now. So, depending on what your appetite and technical level is, you can get further educated on how to use these tools, how to analyze your process and uh, you know how to make them a reality in your own organization. You can also dive in and get hands-on. Uh, on try.highland.com, another website, you can launch a demo lab that has workflow and RPA already configured in it. The demo that I showed exists inside of that hosted platform. So if you want to get in there and experiment with the software a little bit, you can go ahead and do that. You also have the ability to download the software yourself and try it in your own environment. You can try this in your test environment. You can try it in a development environment. Uh, we make the analyst and the designer tools available to anybody that wishes to download them for 60 days. Um, if you've got some needs further than that, I'd love to talk to you more about it. Um, but with the training that's available, um, with the examples that live inside of Try.Highland and with the software that's available here, uh, you can really advance your knowledge, advance your um, your RPA projects uh, on your own. Um, of course, Naviant, happy to help. Highland, myself, happy to help. But we really make these tools available so you can um, think about work in a different way. Uh, we also make plenty of resources available from marketing content to a number of different webinars and white papers that we've done with some of the folks like Craig LeClaire, John Mancini in the industry to really talk more forward-looking about where they see intelligent automation going, uh, both as an industry and in certain market segments like finance and accounting, human resources. Really, really good reads. So go forth and automate. The tools are available. The time is right. The benefits to your organization are just apparent. Um, and this is uh, in hopefully not a passing fad. I don't believe so. Like I said, I've been with Highland about 18 years, been in this uh, space that we now call content services for about 25. And this, since the inception of workflow, to me, this is the most exciting addition to our industry to further drive uh, efficiencies into our organizations. Uh, so with that, I, I thank you for your time. Again, I'm Tim Tallickson with Highland. Uh, my email address is real simple tt at highland.com. If you've got any particular questions about anything that was covered in here, looking for some more information, would be happy to help you. Just please reach on out to me. Thanks again.